Hey, happy anniversary, Brooke. Hey, happy anniversary, Meg. Uh, it's been a whole year uh, <laughs> that we've been doing the podcast. And thank you for joining us uh, one whole year later for Coffee with Curators. I'm Meg, your friendly neighborhood assistant curator from Riverview's Art Space, the nonprofit organization that brings contemporary art exhibits to Lynchburg, Virginia to make art more accessible within our community. And I'm Brooke, your friendly neighborhood regular curator at Riverviews Art Space. If you've been tuning in at all for the last year, you know this podcast is one way we hope to connect our audience with our artists beyond our exhibits. Or if you're new here, now you know. Our guest today is Elsie B. Dixon, our exhibiting artist from uh, May and June. She is a South African-born, Virginia-based visual artist focusing on eco and living platforms. Elsie B. received her MFA in new media from the University of George Mason or George Mason University, in which, which is where Elsie B. and I met. We both we both were there at the same time uh, getting our MFA, so we go way back. Uh, LCB received her BA from University of Everett, Virginia. She is directed and engaged in multi cross disciplinary educational art projects, some of which are incorporated into our exhibit in the gallery, uh, including the Living Hive Project, the SFZ Spotted Lantern Flying Zones of Vegetation. Thank you, LCB, for chatting with us today. Thank you for having me. Well, like Brooke said, you all went to math, um, grad school together, but we got pretty well acquainted because you helped us with install, which was awesome and always fun when we can have the artists present during that time. Uh, but I do have an icebreaker for the folks listening that could have some fun and games with you. And since our podcast is coffee themed, we like to call it the percolator. So, LCB. If you could describe yourself as a beverage of any sort, what would it be? <laughs> what was that? Probably tea. Ah. What kind of like green tea or Earl Grey or? I would say it would be a cup of rooibos tea. Oh, I don't know that tea. It is a, it's a African tea. It's made out of a red bush, and it uh, was cultivated by a Russian that came down to South Africa um, in 1917, I believe. Oh, my goodness. Now, Ken, because Ken, I'm a big tea drinker, is there anywhere that we can get that uh, yeah. around here? You can get it anyway. Uh, maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong, but you can see it It's uh, on any shelf. Uh, in America, it's it's got real wonderful medicinal value. Um, so, uh, food line, you know, would have really? it. Uh, Fresh market would have it. Yeah. Oh, great! I'm I'm always so zoned in on my English breakfast and my green teas that I rarely look left or right at other <laughs> <laughs> other tea. So, but I bet that's I'll give that a try. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, on to the artwork. Um, could you talk a bit about the when you first became interested in working with uh, living organi organisms and, and what have working with living organisms taught you over the years? Well, I grew up with insects. Um, so, you know, I come from a long lineage of French Huguenots that taught their children how to work with silkworms from an early age. And that's how they uh, taught ethics basically. So, um, you know, it was, it was sort of inculcated in me that ethics and insects go together. And my affiliation with insects um, uh, reflects, you 
know, um, the smaller world and the smaller world reflect me in the bigger world. So uh, that was a very early childhood memory. I, in fact, I can't remember when I first interacted with the silkworm, but um, of course, the silk industry never took off in South Africa, but this tradition of teaching your children good values through silk, raising silkworms <laughs> continues. So it's very strange how uh, things get passed down from one generation to the next. Interesting. Now, what, what have they taught you over the years working with silkworms? Well, you know, at first, you it's it's a very basic element uh, of naming your silkworm. We always had to name our silkworm. And I think when you name something, uh, there's an investment, there's a personal interaction, there's a familiarity, there's, a, you know, a, um, empathy that it develops just from naming things. And um, so, you know, that was done first. Uh, but then when you go to school, you become very competitive and you learn about the life cycle and your goal is to produce a product, which is a silk filament for your Bible. And then, but you compete with your classmates. So you learn about marketing. Um, for instance, you know, uh, a silkworm has four phases. And it's in the last phase that it starts spinning. So you've got to calculate, okay, if I could get somebody at school to give me like a hundred little silkworms, I would have more silkworms. I would have to work harder in order to get them to maturity. But, you know, and if I have a big fat uh, silkworm, I can exchange it for a lot of little ones. So, you know, there are multiple things that you could do to sort of manipulate your your marketing empire. And um, that's what we did during school. So yeah, it was a whole thing. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Okay, I gotta ask you, what are some of the setbacks and pitfalls that you you face working with living organisms? Because I know there must be a few. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, there is a few. Um, well, you know, you not, what I do and what my thing is, is to um, uh, make artwork, yes, but also create a sort of an environment for empathy with these tiny little creatures that we, you know, see every day but possibly don't notice. And um, but the pitfalls for me through working with people and working with um, insects that that's hard to control is, um, you know, they're always the oopsies like. I remember I once had a massive installation at the torpedo factory, and that was a summer um, that was very hot. And I was worried that I wouldn't have enough worms, so I ordered some worms in the mail, and they came sick, and they infected my entire batch of spinners that was supposed to open on the opening night. And they literally destroyed my opening night. But I <laughs> so I with like three silkworms spinning for that night when I had anticipated something quite spectacular. You know, things like that. Um, and I remember being online frantically, you know, phoning a guy in Texas. Um, he, he runs an organization called Worm Spit. And I said, Michael, Michael, you have to help me. And he kept on saying to me, Elsby got to toss every silkworm away. You don't know who's infected and who's not infected. Just every box that shows any sign of illness, toss them, kill them. This is, this is not good, you know? And uh, he was right, you know? I, I kept on picking them out, picking all the good ones out, and it was very time consuming. But uh, in the end, I realized, no, you know, when you've got an infected bunch, you've got <laughs> So I learned a lot about you know, so when COVID hit, it was kind of strange because, you know, you sort of go, okay, this is the same kind of situation. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah, everybody stay home. Don't put the, you don't know who's infected. Yeah, yeah and, and that's what he said. Keep your silkworms in different boxes. Keep them in different boxes, you know. Make sure you create as many boxes for them as possible. And that was the only saving grace because, the, those three spinners that opened for me 
came from a specific box and was not infected. But uh, yeah, I had a second round, you know, so I mean, we did have the big display of multiple forms that just didn't happen on opening night, but uh, it did eventually happen because I did stagger them. And those, those were kept very separate. And uh, I listened closely to my friend, Michael, who runs Worms Things <laughs> from very far away. <laughs> While we're talking about pitfalls and setbacks with working with insects, do you have any, like, I don't want to say trouble, that might be a little harsher, but, like, how do you deal with people who are like, oh, bugs, or people who are afraid of creepy crawly things? Like, how do you navigate a conversation with people who might be afraid of what they're looking at? as someone who is kind of mildly afraid of bugs. <laughs> well, you know, I worked for the Smithsonian for a period of time in that butterfly pavilion, and it was really interesting because their method of in engaging the public is to move them through that big cocoon that was built in the Smithsonian insect zoo. And uh, basically people would get their tickets and then they'd be ushered in one door and then they'd move through the butterfly pavilion and then they'd go out the last door. And, um, you know, <laughs> inevitably we'd have the phobias. And, you know, you would not know who has a phobia unless, until they stand in the room with the butterflies. I mean, I had witnessed meltdowns from children you know, certainly, which you expect because, you know, this is a new experience for them. But what astounded me was the adults that had phobias um, to the point where they lost complete control. You know, they, they <laughs> just, um, the flutter of wings, you think, okay, what can be wrong with that? But they just, uh, some of them just absolutely lost it. And we had to refund them their tickets and uh it was it was just really crazy but um yeah <laughs> not a good ex uh, experience or a pleasant experience for everybody but you know with an exhibition you can control it mm -hmm. and i think uh for instance i had an exhibition of five months in, at um um automatic in arlington it's closed now but that's where that big dome was and they would have these fantastic performances in the dome. And everybody would walk past my studio before going, my sort of studio lab. It was the lab studio downstairs. Uh, and I worked with Cynthia Connolly. She was just amazing. But we saw thousands of people coming through for these shows. And they would stop by my exhibit. And, you know, as long as you do um advertise the exhibit uh, uh, Cynthia had me keep a blog so you, you pass on as much information as possible and you set it up in stages so first we had feeding the worms and activities and people could come in and feed the worms and then people could come in and build structures and then people could come in and you know, watch the worms spin, you know, so I'd always make these announcements on the blog. This week, come out this week. <laughs> and, and you'd break the life cycle sort of in little parts. And then in the end, we actually took pictures with people having thousands of silk moths on them. And that was the same sensation, you know, you have a lot of fluttering. And some people, uh, could have it on their hands some people could and a lot of people were intrigued and they seemed to lose fear the more they interacted so if you have a lab situation you can definitely acclimatize people slowly to it and you can give them that closeness with the insect that you can't otherwise do you know when when an insect approaches you in in uh, real life it's usually a, a, a surprise <laughs> and For both of you involved. <laughs> yeah, but if you, you you can you can acclimatize people in a in a lab setting. All right. Next. 
Uh, well, you you have a lot of you've worked on several collective projects. Um, so, what is it like working with other, and how does that affect the creative process for both of you? I, I think it's a research that 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 the research sort of informs the project. Um, so, I did a project with B on the 29th corridor and the interaction was with the beekeepers right so um i mean the project revolved around the fact that many beekeepers just don't speak to one another and they believe their bibles are the only bible and everybody's got a different bible but we've got these big eco problems right so um if they don't get passed down through beekeeping associations you know beekeepers are often often sort of solitary creatures um they they work with their bees and they want nothing to do with human beings and then you do get collegial groups the beekeeping associations are just amazing and the network of beekeeping associations is amazing so what we did was we built these with the sculpture uh by placing parts of the sculpture in bee hives all down the 29th corridor of virginia and um but you know i had to really work with um uh, a lot of beekeepers to discern exactly how to build the the, the sculpture in order for it to be able to pla be placed in the um you know i need to, uh, in the uh, hive i needed to know <laughs> when bees do what activity at what time of year. So, you know, I think what we forget with um, the industrial world we live in right now is that we have created artificial systems, but, you know, a life cycle of an insect brings you back to the natural system. It allows you, it trains you to understand natural systems that work for you know, uh, the sun, climate, uh, heat, uh, things like that. Now you can do everything artificially, but ultimately, um, you know, uh, you, can, you can control it. So, yeah, um, and that's basically it. I mean, we, we just learn with each project for the spotted lanternfly, there was a big learning curve. I remember applying with these and then calling me back saying, you can get the grant, but we don't want you to work with uh, bees, we want you to work with spotted lanternflies, but you'll have to come up because they had a quarantine section for this invasive species, and they wanted me to come and observe it before the, before I put forth my my proposal, and I did, and it was very interesting. They were like little bots, you know. They were so quick, uh, and clearly not from Northern America at all. I mean, they they would just weird weird little thing and uh like i said incredibly uh, agile and, and cool um, you could see so well you know, you know and 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 you realize why you know we just have no control over them whatsoever they're just uh, uh an, an incredibly hardened species and you want to go well goodness what else is in thailand you know that i don't know about so um it it was very interesting learning about them and learning how they move and learning their life cycle and once again they go through this life cycle that's very different they feed on plants by drilling a hole into the vein of the plant and then they all take turns they very very collegial so they take turns in sipping uh, at the at the center of the core of the plant and just kill the plant that way but then when they metamorphosize into you know their last stage um they squirt out the sticky substance that that's very sweet super sweet and um it makes everything mold around wherever they were so everything turns black and it's it's just uh, a phenomenon to be you know and i think everything comes down to observation and i think artists have done this for ages so, you know you you observe things by drawing it that's that's an observation study but you can definitely observe systems too and data systems and 
reconnect life cycle systems. It's all the same, you know, it's just a close, close, close observation. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, more about the Spotted Lanternfly project? About what, how did you, kind of the, the end product, how you got there, how it was working within the community? Um, yeah, so, so my charge was to work with the community. And, um, you know, usually, uh, and, and I was happy to do it, but what, what took me aback was usually, you know, like with, with the silkworms and with the um, uh, bees, you, you, you basically engage with people uh, in a positive way about the insects. Talk about the benefits of this, but it was very different for the spotted lanternfly, and Pennsylvania just astounded me because they were not politically correct about killing this at all. And uh, you know, in fact, it was a government mandate to kill on site, and they would train tiny little kids to go around killing this insect whenever they saw it. So. Uh, all I could remember was we had these mud daubers in our farmhouse when Ina, my daughter, was very little, and um, she had watched me once take one of her blocks and sort of squish a mud dauber because I didn't want it to sting her, you know. So um, I would kill them as they come in. And it took, I mean, I think she was about 10 months, a little block, and she, she squished. <laughs> um, herself one day and I was just astounded at that that the way we can train our children to do anything right um but so this took me aback seeing teachers normally very compassionate people and children just killing outright you know and then when I was talking I said well no you know we want to be polit politically correct here we we, we need to really figure out how we're going to catch this insect and how we, you know, going to uh, uh, kill the insect because I, so we finally came down to, okay, the, the best way to kill this insect is simply to get it to go to sleep. And how do you do that is you catch it in large quantities and you just put it in the freezer. <laughs> and then they, they fall asleep, right? So, this is what we did, and, and, and we worked from this lab that they had over at Lehigh Valley at Penn State, and I would go in, and we would catch all of these insects, um, and we would put them in bags, and we would just put them in the freezer, and sure enough, in a couple of hours, uh, <laughs> we're no longer alive. <laughs> But, uh, and that's how we basically got no damage to the wings, you know, um, and we could, then, then we went into the processing phase where we uh, got everybody to de-wing the insects. Nobody liked doing that. That was like, people just did not like doing that. And if you think about you catching plants and anybody that has to process animals, I think it's the same thing. You just not fun it's not that is not something that you want to do uh it's it's something we we are deep, it makes us deeply aware of our predatory nature you know and and we we sort of feel extreme guilt when we do that um so it ended up that i and the scientists ended up doing most of the chucking, you know, the wing, <laughs> the wing tearing off. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, because it was so hard for the public to do. I mean, they, they literally, students just did not want to do that. And, but then we started, you know, we collected the wings. Uh, now, the spotted lantern fly has this beautiful speckled wing, large wing. And then it has this beautifully colored back wing that's black, white, and bright red. Just an absolutely gorgeous red. So what we would do is we'd separate the wings, um, you know, the spotted wings. And, the, and uh, then we started pinning.
turning it onto these large platforms uh, in a mandala shape. So once again, if you're working with the public, it needs to be extremely simple, but how do you make something spectacular from something simple? Mandalas are absolutely fantastic. You work from the inside out um, and uh, it works very well. So people enjoyed the, the spinny and they could, they would go in creative tangents you know, you, you would see the most amazing little patterns. And, uh, well, you've got them in the gallery right now, and you could see how people, people's imaginations went wild. Uh, I mean, my, my, my instructions were work from the inside out and make sure you keep it at consistent growth. But those inconsistent uh, parts were fascinating to me, you know, and made it really... Uh, fun and unique and, and pretty. I mean, people really played with it. Definitely, like, the most impressive thing that people want to talk about when they walk in, as soon as they see it, they're like, how? Why? How long did it take? How many people were involved? It's just, a, it's a very impressive thing to look at, and once they realize the intricate patterns and the time to pin each wing it's just their mind is just blown i had two women from ohio walk in and they knew exactly what they were looking at oh. and i'm like oh you know what a fire lantern fly is They're like oh yeah we don't want them <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's that attitude to, like people people know it and like they see how dangerous it's going to be if it they continue to spread as it's wasted Yes, and it's interesting to see when you tell people that this is an invasive species, how they're, they just change. They're like, oh, yeah. you know, then, then they, they actually, instead of being like, oh, the poor bug, they're, they're like, oh, well, then this is a, this is a good thing that, that to keep this bug, you know, from infesting our, um, our vineyards and our uh, herbers. And it's like, yes, it is. It, it, it is a good thing. And then and, and how that quickly changes their perception of the piece. Because the first reaction when they don't understand um, the species is, oh, poor bug. And then they find out that, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> this bug is, is, is disastrous. It, it really does. It, it, it's interesting to see that moment when it, it shifts. Yeah. And I, I think everything's so uh, closely aligned with our food sources. So uh, Pennsylvania very quickly found out that they were losing millions and billions of dollars uh, within their uh, local agriculture um, uh, connectors, you know. So yeah, all your vineyards and everything was just destroyed within one swoop. Of Yes, and that's what I tell people. I'm like, you know all the vineyards you love on 29? <laughs> I was like, yeah, we we have to be very careful. And then that it all of a sudden they're like, not my vineyard. Wow. It's like, they don't really care whose vineyard. <laughs> no, they really don't. And, and the one thing, you know, I mean, you, we, what we did was you realize that, that it's a disruptor. So this little as many invasives are disruptors, this one is particularly disruptive to our food chains, our local food chains. And, 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 and I think you lost um, uh, uh, the SFV. Yeah, because that that is also um, a disruption in music. So that's a symbol for disruption in music, and that's why we decided. And it also has all the letters we needed to say. Uh, Swatted land and fly zones of syncopation. <laughs> yep. So good, so good. Um, and I'm actually really interested in um, how you 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 really found a wonderful overlap between art and science. And do you find that that having that that overlap um, reaches a broader audience? Do you, do you find that 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 pulls in? Um, a different uh, demographic? Well, you know, I, I just think we're getting further and further removed as human beings 
from the from nature and um uh it's not so much science as observation and i think there's always this in this connection between art and science because of that one element that we both do uh this close observation this long observation this this uh microscopic observation or aerial observation i mean we we just turn things upside down in the studio but we also turn things upside down in the science lab and i think um it's just we need to get more people to do that because in doing that you observe the true true structures um uh now what we've started doing is manipulating things and creating false structures and it's almost like um uh you know misinformation now and marketing and stuff like that so we we started off the world war ii telling people you know clover is bad for your lawn here take these chemicals left over from the war and just throw it on your lawn and and then put in these chemicals to rejuvenate it and everything will be hunky dory and we created we started creating within our lawn systems this really artificial platform that just does not fit in nature and it's completely false right so it's it's bottom bottom it can fall out at any point if you don't put the chemical on it's like somebody being on crack cocaine or somebody being on a chemical substance as a human being you 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 reach a point where you your body doesn't tolerate it you either have to overdose or you have to uh try to get off of the substance right but your body is in complete shock so what we've done is we put our lawns in complete shock we put our own bodies in complete shock with these chemicals and these uh, false platforms but what what insects do is i mean certainly we're doing it with bees too i mean we putting chemicals on bees and there's a reaction so we're we're learning we're starting to learn um that these these false platforms really does not it's not sustainable it's not um with a life cycle it literally is a cycle you gear up you gear over and you gear back in so it 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 is a reproduction but what we're doing now is we're sterilizing everything we're sterilizing our food systems we're sterilizing ourselves we're sterilizing things so that it 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 doesn't reproduce take it back a little bit further to art could you just um just kind of talk about how like the role of drawing in your work like how, what what role does it play since you do have all of these <laughs> these elements that are left to chance by the insects and all that but you have some great drawings to the living eyes in your gallery right now that are interesting so well yes i love to draw and um i've been drawing uh I was very little and um uh, it's interesting you know it sort of comes naturally uh, I was looking at the campers uh, I run this little museum and we've got campers now and you can sit and see a whole bunch of kids at a table and there'll be one or two the first thing they want to do is just make these elaborate drawings and they do and it's just this natural thing and um so but mainly you know i mean i've become very well versed in multiple medias uh i enjoy sculpture and 3d forms but um you know the first translation or the first visual uh communication is drawing and um i i i love to draw and i had to come up with some kind of form for the beekeepers that they could relate to so we started with a um you know we started with a hive form 
but it pretty much all of our conversation started going towards fecundity, right? So uh, you might see some penis uh, evolving within the in the shapes of that high form, but it, you know, if you think about buildings, buildings and architecture do the same thing. But I wanted to address this fecundity because in looking at bees and looking at the reproduction of these these animals for our food source, I mean, what I was talking about with the disruption is you, you really have to address it as at, at its source. So you have to kind of um, think of it as as uh, how do we reproduce? And um, the, I was hoping to bring the two ideas of fecundity, the hive, or three ideas, and the bees together somewhere. Excellent. Since we're talking about bees, and I love to make bread, <laughs> and a lot of people made bread who have never made bread over the pandemic. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the Bees and Floss project? Uh, the, the the which project? Uh, the mise en place. Oh, um, yeah, everything in its place. That French phrase, mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, you know, needing to have your kitchen in line and having everything exactly where it's supposed to be. Um, yeah, you know, I, I started thinking about live enzymes and um, the thing with bread making is that's also a process that that's a false system, um, but it it feeds. It has so much a potential for feeding for uh, nutrients um, that it's quite astounding. So uh, you start with live grass, right? And then you pick the seeds out of this live grass, uh, live seeds, and you literally crush the seeds. And um, until it's dead. <laughs> and then uh, you mix it uh, with multiple different things and you add yeast, which is the element that makes it come back to life because the yeast feeds off of the crushed seed. So it, <laughs> it has, a, so this is why bread is always connotated with, um, you know, everlasting life or resurrection, you know, in, in a Christian context. So you literally take, you take something alive, you kill it, and then you resurrect it. And then the end product, and, and then you kill it again through heat. And the end product is something that's incredibly nutritious and valuable. Um, so, you know, if you think about the way bees also and I, I did it sort of in a honeycomb uh, format because I was working with bees with, with one uh, in, in one way and with the bread in another. But, you know, the, the way bees store food was my jumping off point. Um, and uh, the, the bread really represents the incredible way that we can store nutrients uh, or create nutrients that can keep us alive, even with a small bake. Anybody can mm -hmm. rip bread for, uh, for you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it is. It's just perhaps the most nutritious um, food we have, although it's very doctored right now. So yeah. go to local bakery to find out about real bread and eat real bread to stay healthy. It does not make you fat. In fact, quite no. And it's a it's a global food. It's a global food. It, it is it is a global food. And I love that you know you use the honey. Um, that, so you're using this product from the bees that the yeast eats to feed us. I right. mean, just that what a what an incredible uh, process. And, and and you know, I used to when I worked with kids. I used to make bread with them because they honestly didn't know where bread came from or how it was made. So I can only Im imagine that people must have been fascinated when you did this <laughs> and, and showed them the process of how something we consume almost daily. And, and people don't know where it comes from. 
And it's so easy to put together. I mean, it literally, you can grow the root just with a little bit of flour and water. It's um, and, and of course, something sweet. So either a little bit of honey or sugar creates that yeast that grows. But you can definitely make yourself, you know, you can grow things. And I think that's, that's the part that I enjoyed so much is here's this total manipulation, but it's for the good. So how can we turn around our industry right again and nourish it? Yes, and and I think you you use the word empathy, and, and once again, when people find out where something comes from, it gives them it changes the way they see that 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 object and gives them great empathy for uh, the plants and the that produce the wheat and the bees that produce the honey, and and you know and, and you talk about how we we were we seem to keep getting further and further away from from our natural um, existence. We, we kind of encapsulate ourselves in plastic at the moment. Um, yes, but the more we um, see our relationship with, with bees, with wheat, with um, the silkworms, with the more we understand a little bit more about ourselves. Right. It, it puts us you know, when you go to the ocean, um, uh, certain people say it regulates your breathing because of that tide going in and out. But, uh, you know, we all need to regulate ourselves. So with interacting with insects, I think we regulate ourselves. It's almost like a therapy. Um, and, and if you think about art, art reg can do the same thing. It can regulate you. Whether you're looking at art that is extremely in your face or art that is beautiful. It doesn't really matter whether you're looking at something ugly or something uh, profoundly beautiful. What matters is that it tells you to change your life, right? So as the Wilfred poem says, you know, you, you have to look at a piece of art and be able to change your life. And um, that is called regulation. If it can allow you to stabilize and balance, then it serves truth. And uh, I think that's what we, we as producers and artists do, is we produce something that has an effect of balance or regulation. You know, right now we've got these equity exhibitions that play a profound role in helping us balance our justice system. You know, so we, it's all, it's all about balance. <laughs> I, I absolutely agree with you. And I think we are out of balance. Right. Um, right now. Um, okay, so what's next? Tell us what you're up to next. <laughs> well, um, I'm actually working uh, in a milk town right now. And um, we have just engaged in a massive yarn bombing. Uh, with 25 um, community groups, city community groups, and uh, we've got a lot of spokes and, and community interest groups that have supported this. Uh, as uh, you know, as a spoke, uh, the chamber, Parks and Rec, uh, Goodwill, sort of supplied us with this fiber. Um, it, it's really just a pandemic. Um, a coming out of pandemic program, but it's kept me busy and out of trouble for a while. Uh, what's coming up next with insects? I'm not quite sure. You know, I I have to. Um, I think the pandemic sort of was a, was a interruption in and of itself, but um, uh, you know, yeah. I continue to have good conversations, and there are uh, things that I'm thinking about right now, but. As of now, <laughs> I'm not doing much with it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of like we were put in our cocoons, and now we're kind of poking our heads out of our cocoons <laughs> to <Right. think, laughs> figure out what's next. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Elsie. That was, I feel like a romanticist now. We talked about nature and art and everything. <laughs> 
balanced and beautiful, and left to its own devices. So, good mood for a Saturday <laughs> to start my day with. Yeah, we need to we just go do some yoga and settle down. <laughs> hey, I'm just gonna go for a hike now and just you know, sit in my yard or something. Uh, I'm gonna go sit in my yard full of clover, in which I do notice the 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 neighbors going by being like. Holy cow, she's the what's with all the clover. Uh, so, you know, so I'll go sit in my yard full of clover and be thankful for that the universe gave me a yard full of clover. Yeah, well, I mean, clover's good, nitrogen is good. It's good. Oh, but if I see so many people with, you know, like any sort of little lump of clover or dandelion is, is, is like some um, talk about invasive species. And I'm like, they're not an invasive species. <laughs> they belong here and they need to be here. So I'll go sit in my clover. <laughs> we might have to do the same with the spotted lantern fly eventually. Just accept them and figure out how to live with them. Mm -hmm. well, thank you so much, LCB. Uh, it has been a thrill working with you, a true pleasure, and I can tell you the Lynchburg community has gotten so much out of your exhibition at River View. So thank you for all the effort it took to bring your work here and share it with our community. Thank you guys, and uh, thank you for all your help. You were the most awesome installers I've ever had. <laughs> I appreciate it very much. Uh, yeah. That was a lovely um camaraderie and putting up the show. I appreciate it. Anytime. Thank you guys. Anytime. Thank you.